The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, feel free to populate in the front row. I'm not that scary. But, okay, so today we're going to look at more greedy algorithms. So I think you went over Kruskal's algorithm and how you do the sorting and sort in the lecture. So, so going back to make change from last recitation, uh, so this is like a sort of a variant on that. So instead of discrete coins, we now have continuous coins in the sense of, so like the analogy here is let's say you have n metals and each of the metals has some value given by CI dollars per kilogram or whatever units you prefer. And you want to achieve some value to you, you want to give someone T dollars worth of metal. And you want to do this while minimizing, oh, so okay, I should mention this. Uh, Ki is the weight of every metal that you will give, this, give, give to the person. So you're taking Ki of metal I, and you are going to, and you have to ensure, so basically you have to ensure that sum, summation of Ki Ci over all I is equal to T. And in doing so, you want to minimize the summation over all Ki. So that makes sense? So you have a bunch of metals. Some of them are more expensive than others. And you want to measure them out and give someone a certain fixed value. So anyone have any ideas how to do this? Should be. Should, should be the first thing that comes to mind. So you have a bunch of metals, some of them with certain costs, and you're trying to uh, create a value t. And so which metal would you want to pick? So OK, it should seem intuitive that you want to pick, if you want to minimize the weight of the metal, you would want to pick the, the most expensive one per weight. Right? So let's start by sort by CI. And we want to sort it in decreasing order. Does that make sense? So if you have the most expensive metal, you want to use the, uh, as much of that as you can so that your weight is minimized. So once you sort by CI, so let's say you have your costs right now are like, uh, C, but let's call this some C1, C2, up to CN. And these are in sorted order. So it's increasing this way. So now you use, so you now take your value T, and you look at T by C1. And that, that is the amount of weight you would need to generate T. So you look at, uh, look at how, much, how much you have here. So the amount of metal, oh, so constraint I forgot to mention. You are given a limited amount of every metal. OK, that, that's, <laughs> that's, okay that, that, it's not that trivial. All right, so you have, uh, let's mention that. So you have, is that used? No, it's not. Amount. Does that make more sense? So, so you look at t over ci, and if t over ci is uh, less, I'm sorry, is uh, greater than w of i, then you just use the amount of, amount you need to construct w i, and you're done. Otherwise, you use all of c1 ci. So if it is if it's less than w i, uh, in that case, you uh, sorry, other way around. If it's greater than w i, you use all of, you use all of it. And then you move on to the next one, the next one, and so on. So that seems like pretty intuitive. Uh, let's actually do a formal proof of that. So how you go about proving this is that. So let's say, so it's called the current-based method. So basically what you have is, let's say you're not using the most expensive metal you have at this point. So let's say your most expensive metal has cost CI, but instead you decide to use CJ. So let's say you decide to use some kj amount of cj. So the, so the value you're getting from this is uh, cj kj. And instead, if you use ci, how much, how much metal would you need to get the same value? You would need cj kj over ci. Does that make sense? So this is, this is the value you would obtain by using kj kilograms of this, me this metal. 
So if you instead use this one, you'd get this value. And since you, so this was, this was the most expensive one. Since ci is greater, greater than cj, this value, so this value is less than kj. So by using this metal instead of that one, you are decreasing the amount of the weight you would need. So your, so your minimization goes down. Make sense? So that's like a very simple greedy algorithm. It's, and it's ex like the algorithm is exactly, exactly what you'd expect, and the proof isn't very hard. So let's move on to a more slightly more interesting one. Let's, okay. So this is process scheduling. So let's say you have a computer and you're running n processes. And each of the processes has a time, uh, t1 to, to tn, so the n processes. And you want to order them in some way. So first you will do process p1, then you'll do process p2, and so on and so forth. Uh, then you define a completion time. So completion time is simply when does process i end. So when does process i end? You just p1 plus p, it's like the time for p1 plus time for p2 up to pn. So basically, you have all your processes. So let's say this is, this is p1, this is p2, and so on. And the completion time for a certain process in the middle is just the sum of all the times before it. That's completion time. And now what you want to do is you want to minimize the average completion time which is summation over all the completion times over n. So any ideas what an algorithm for this would look like? So essentially, you want to minimize the sum of like, all these times. So all these times, you want to minimize the average of these. So what do you want to do? Do you want to shift the slower, shift the, like, the processes which take more time? Do you want to keep them at the end, or do you want to keep them at the beginning? So if you have a, like a bunch of small processes, would you do them at the end? Would you do them at the beginning? So completion time is when does, so let's say this is process PI. And completion time for process PI is like this distance. It's like when does PI get completed? So it's summation of all the times. So the time taken for P1, P2 up to the end. So, so you want to basically minimize the average of these values. So would you put the smaller process, would you put the shorter process at the end or at the beginning? Which one, which one would decrease your average? Beginning? Makes sense, right? Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. So you basically want to like scrunch these lines towards the beginning so your average is smaller. Uh, note that this, 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 total, this total length is always the constant. It's like summation over all ti. So anyway, so let's go about, so okay, this is the strategy. Uh, again, sort by uh, ti, and this is increasing order, and that's it, basically. So this is your algorithm, sort by ti, and put the, use the process in that order. So let's try to prove this. So the way you prove this is a pretty generic method, which is often used to prove real algorithms. So let's say that this is not the optimal. Let's say someone comes up to you and tells you, OK, I have, I have, a, better, I have a better sequence. I have a sequence, let's say, called, let, let's say I have a sequence of p1 to pn. And that sequence does better than a sorted order. So you're like, OK, so if, if this is not, not sorted, uh, then you have some elements in the middle. Let's say you call them pi is greater than pj, where pj uh, with i is less than j. So there's some pi here. There's some pj here, such that this is greater than that. So it's not, it's not in sorted order. So like, you can always find a pair like that. So now I'm going to now I'm going to claim that if you swap, if you swap these two values, so you swap pi and pj, that'll actually decrease whatever current complete, uh, average completion time you have. So you have so initially you had something like this. So no, let's not draw the whole winder. So let's say you had something like uh, you had this process, so pi. Actually, this is the big process, right? So like this is pi, and this is pj. And now I'm saying that, and they have some stuff in the middle. And my claim is that, no, this is not, this is not optimal. You'd do much better if you move the pj over here. So you want to go from this to this, and big process. So let's see what, what changes when you go from there to there. So first of all, observe that. The completion times of everything behind this is the same. They all have the same completion, and nothing is affected. And you're only changing like these two things. So, like everything after this is also the same, has the same completion time. So the only things that are changing 
or this one, this one, and all the ones up to this one. Even this one has the same completion time. Make sense? So how much is this changing by? So let's define, let's say, so let's define this. Delta is equal to T of pi minus T of pj. So the difference between these two processes. So what is the, so the original completion time was of pi was this. And now the corresponding process down here, the completion time is decreased by delta. So com completion time first goes down by minus delta. Uh, this is just a summation of completion time. This divided by n is a constant. So like, that's, that's, you just want to minimize this. So first it goes, so this one it goes down by minus delta. So let's look at the next process. The next process is something like this. So again, it's the, the, these are not changed. You're only swapping these two. So this completion time also goes down by minus delta. And so on and so forth. So you just get a bunch of minus deltas which is equal to however many processes you have. But that, that's not even important. What is important is that just by swapping, you're, get, you're going to get at least one minus delta. And delta is positive because assumption, uh, oh, t. This assumption was that TPI minus TPJ is positive. So just by swapping, you're going to always decrease it. So the claim that that sequence was an optimal solution is wrong. So you can always do better by swapping to inversions. So like those, that out of sorted order is called an inversion. So if you swap an inversion, you always get a better result. Okay. Does that proof make sense? Okay. okay. All right. So that's a slightly more interesting recent algorithm. So let's move on to the third one we have here. The third one is even event overlap. So this is how it works. So, so you wake up in the morning, and you look at your calendar. And being an MIT student, your calendar looks pretty full. So let's say this is what it looks like. So these are your events. Okay, let's use some colors. Make it a little clearer, possibly. And let's say you have another event over here. You have something here. You have something here. You have something here. And you have. Okay. So okay, let's move this down. Actually, here. So, so the problem here is that you have these bunch of events planned out. Now, clearly they're overlapping, so you can't attend all of them. So the idea you, is you make a bunch of clones of yourself, and so in this case, so look at the matching colors. So if you create clone number one goes here, and clone number two goes to to red, and clone number three goes to blue. So then clone number one does this, clone number three does the blue one, clone number two does uh, red. Uh, I guess we should move the red back a little bit, or forward a little bit, just to make it clear. Yeah, there we go. So, and now, now, you, can, so now you can easily see that this is optimal. So you can, you, can, you, you can do this with three clones and no less. So you make three clones, and then you can go after spring break, and your schedule is fine. So now how would you approach this problem? So what is a greedy strategy to, given a number of intervals, how do you find the minimum number of clones you need to cover your day? Any ideas? What is a naive thing you could do? So you want, you want to do every, you want to do every event, but you, but like, so this clone, can't, so like clone number one does this event, then you can't do this event or this event. Uh, you want to do all the events. You want to minimize the number of clones. So it's like interval scheduling, but you want to do all you want to do all the intervals, and but you can but you're allowed to use multiple people to do all the intervals. So yes. Yeah. Sort by, uh, n time. by n time. Okay. What do you do after you sort by n time? So you're close. So you, you do begin by sorting. But, so it's, you, you could actually do it by sorting by end time. It's easier to visualize you sort by sort time. So leading from that, anyone want to top in? Yeah. So yeah, essentially, every time, yeah, every time you can't add it to 
one of your current clothes, you create a new one. You could also do it by n time because it's symmetrical, right? So you, like, if you start by n time, then you start with the smallest, lar largest n time and go backwards. Exactly the same thing. So let's write it down. So So start by start time. And so actually, let's, let's work out this example. So in this case, you would go, OK, actually, so if once you sort, so first you have 1, then you have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's sorted by start time. And then you have, so you, first you go for this one. Uh, then you go for 2. And 2 can, intersects with, 2 intersects with 1. So you put two into it. So this is this is clone number one, and then you have to create a new clone for two. So you create the new clone, and there we go. So then you go to three. Three clashes with both one and two. So you have to create a new clone again. So in that case, you go forth and create three. Then you go to four. Now four, you see, is not it's just clash with two and three, but it but it's good, it is good with one. So you just put four over here. And if you continue like this, you'll essentially get uh, this and this. Make sense? So that's how you schedule it. So does the algorithm make sense? Let's try to prove its correctness. So let's say, let's look at the instance where you're inserting the emmet clone. So let's, or, yeah, let's, uh, so emmet clone. So when the mth clone is created, you already have some already have some values in here. So you have one, two, all the way up to m minus one. So now you bring in your interval, and you see that it collides with all of these values. So let's just draw the final interval for all of these guys. So let's say the final interval for this guy was out here. Let's say the final interval for this interval for this guy was out here, and so on. Blah, 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 blah. And so when you create the mth clone, you look at the start time. So what happens is that the start time, start time is somewhere, let's say, here. And now you know that because of this, so you're only adding a new clone when you don't have an available slot. So that means that there is some interval here which intersects with this guy. Okay? So how do you prove so how do you show that there's one interval? So like consider any level. Let's say there is no interval that intersects with it. So that means that there is either so there is a so if there if there were a gap here, so if there were a gap here, so let's say at like this location, this interval wasn't here. Let's say if you if you extrapolate this line outward, so this is this is your current starting value, and let's say you look at this line, and in this segment, you can you can't have something which starts after this because this is the current highest starting starting time. So there's no interval which starts after this. So the only intervals that can exist have already ended here. And if they've already ended here, that means you could have added it here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, then you can show that, OK. So at every, every existing, if you're adding a new clone, that means at every existing level, you have something which intersects. So what that means is that you have, you have a single point of time where there are m minus 1 plus 1 intervals. That means that. You absolutely need m intervals, regardless of what your strategy is. So adding the mth clone is necessary. So if you go on continues the argument, like let's say your total number of clones was m. So you can just do this argument for m. There you will show that, oh, if I followed all these rules correctly, I can show that the start time for m intersects with m minus 1 other intervals. So there's no way I can create a, pro a scheduling with less than m clones. Did that argument make sense? Or should I go over it again? Okay. So, yeah, that's it's a bit hand baby, but that shouldn't be it. Okay. In any case, okay. Uh, well, that's the three problems. So I guess we could go back to this one, and sort of give the motivation for this. So this could, for example, be used in uh, this could be used in scheduling processes for servers, for instance. So let's say your server gets requests to run n processes, and they have times like that. So this is like shortest time first. So you take all the short, like the smallest jobs, and you execute them in the beginning. And you wait for other jobs. And this can also be done online. So if you're going to have an online version of this. 
So if you take this algorithm and you do it online, so let's say your server is running jobs and you get a new request. So you, you, you get a new request. So you already have some set of T1 to Tn. And let's say you're running jo at, at, this cur at the current moment, Ti is your smallest job. And you're running it, and you're currently at this point. So, and then you can, like, in the middle of running it, you can get like new requests for jobs. So, how how would you modify this algorithm to handle that? So, you still want to maintain this like l lowest average completion time thing. So, how would you handle this situation? So, let's say you're in the middle of a job and you get a bunch of new requests. So, your current set is all these existing jobs plus some plus some other things you get in here. So what, 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 would you consider switching to a different job here, or would you keep doing this? Let's say one of the, one of, let's say one of the new jobs you get is really small. Would you, so what you would do in that case is that instead of continuing with this, you would switch to the sm current smallest job. So you, you would look at the remaining time. So that's important. So you can forget about the, uh, the amount of time you already spent on this. You know what the remaining time is, and that is all that's relevant. So if you just so you can just like consider this problem in a different framework. It's the exact same. It's, it's, exact, it's the exact same question. You just look at remaining time instead of like total time. So if you're in the middle of a job and if a new one comes in which is smaller, you just switch to that, complete that, and go and then then look at the remaining times for everything. So at some point of time, you might have like a lot of half-completed jobs just like lying around, and you, for all of them you'll update their TI values to remaining time rather than start time. And that gives you a nice way to like, decide which processes to do in online. And that gives you, so this is assuming that all of, your, all of your tasks have equal weights. So like all of them have equal reward. So obviously that's not always the case. You might, want, you might be like pushing back a very long job forever because smaller things keep coming in. And that might get important. But if, if everything is equally weighted, then this is the optimal thing you can do. And it's a very simple strategy. Anyway, so those are the three problems I want to discuss. Uh, do you guys have any other questions or comments or anything? Good? Okay. Uh, we finished pretty early, so I guess have a, have a great spring break. <laughs>